much of the debate that we find um, is fueled by a misunderstanding of what science is. So very briefly, first thing I need to say is, so that we know what we're talking about, I'm talking about natural science. So I take uh, modern natural science uh, to have basically two underlying characteristics that can be considered to define its scope. The first is um, that it presupposes that the world can be described by models that are basically invariant as to time and place. So if I do an experiment you know, in some place at some time, and then someone else can come and do the same type of experiment somewhere else at some other time, and provided they pay attention to the relevant details, they're going to get the same answer. In other words, science is based on the idea of repeatable experiments. The second characteristic of science, which is less, perhaps, less widely recognized, is that it restricts its attention to matters on which it's possible for rational observers to agree on the results of the experiment, maybe not the interpretation. Um, and I'm going to call that requirement a requirement of clarity. Some would say this is a requirement of mathematical description, but I think that, uh, that interprets the word mathematical too broadly to be helpful in this, in this way. So I'm, I'm using the word clarity in a kind of technical sense uh, to mean this intersubjective uh, communication. Um, so science discusses the world insofar as it's repeatable, either because repeatable uh, tests are possible in the, in the lab, so that's lab science, or because in observational science, so many different examples of the kind of phenomenon that one is interested in are available for study that in effect we've got repeatable tests. So that would be characteristic of, uh, of sciences like astronomy and, and some parts of geology and so forth. This is, though, um, a limitation of the scope of science. Now, um, let me give a couple of examples. Uh, one of the first example I want to give is Michael Faraday, another si wonderful scientist of history. He's a, he's a marvelous character um, who uh, grew up with essentially no formal education. He was uh, apprenticed to a bookbinder in his early teens, and that's where he got practically all of his education from. He knew all almost no mathematics, and yet he was the most wonderfully creative science, scientist who developed these kind of pictorial views, and so um, our understanding of, of, of field theory, our pictorial understanding of electric fields, for example, comes from, uh, from Faraday. He has no less than five uh, ph phenomena or laws that are named after him. And he, he it was said of him, uh, that whenever, you know, in those early days of the, the 19th century when, when uh, uh, new uh, discoveries in electricity and magnetism were coming out, you know, almost every month, every time he heard about one of the new discoveries, the first thing he would do is he'd rush off to his lab and try to reproduce it in his lab. And here is, you know, the artist's impression of Faraday in his lab at the Royal Institution in London, uh, trying, at least in my mind, trying to reproduce uh, somebody's um, uh, experiment that he's just heard about. But the reason he gave for this insistence was not that he was a hardcore skeptic. On the contrary, he said it was because his imagination had to be anchored in what he called the facts. So he says, the facts were important to me and saved me. He says, without experiment, I am nothing. No, was he a uh, a skeptic materialist? No, he wasn't a skeptic materialist. Actually, Faraday was uh, a firmly convinced Christian, and for most of his adult life, he was a mem member of a non-conformist Christian sect called the Sandemanians. In fact, uh, for much of that time, he was an elder of the con congregation, which meant that basically he was the minister and had to speak at the, um, uh, at the Sunday meetings and visit the sick and so forth, and he, and he did so. So that's an example of the importance of reproducibility. I was going to give you another example of reproducibility that comes from my own experience. I'm a fusion scientist, and, and cold fusion came up a lot of years ago. I just don't have time to do this. But just let me say, cold fusion is bunk. The reason why we know cold fusion is bunk uh, is because it can't be uh, done reproducibly, and that's really the, the test. So if this is the case, where does this antagonism come from? that we hear so much about 
in the, uh, in the modern world between uh, science and uh, religious faith. I would say it comes very predominantly from what I call scientism. Scientism is the belief that the only meaningful knowledge is science. It's not often articulated in, in precisely that way, or it's not e often not articulated at all, but it's nevertheless present in very many of the discussions. Um, but scientism, the belief that science is all the knowledge that really counts, is not a finding of science. It's, it's a philosophical belief that is essentially independent of science. I mean, the success of science, particularly in the 19th century, um, led to perhaps a certain plausibility to the view that this might, might be the case. But today, the philosophical underpinnings of scientism um, really are to a large extent, extent discredited. So my own opinion is really rather simple. Science has distinctive characteristics that I've just tried to outline for you in a, in a, in a very uh, cursory way. And it, these characteristics lend it unequaled power for finding out about the world insofar as it can be described in these scientific terms. But the presuppositions that are built into science's whole approach essentially limit its field of application. So science can't in the end really be used uh, to investigate history, parts of history perhaps, but, but history as a whole cannot be described in scientific terms because it deals with essentially the unique events. So often historians are interested in the most unique events. Uh, of the past, um, which of course science is incompetent to study. It can't really deal with the arts because the arts can't be described in a kind of reductionistic approach that is part of this science, science and, and the clarity uh, characteristic that I've mentioned. Um, the humanities, of course, can't really be handled by science because science rules out personality from the beginning. I'll say a bit more about this in a little, in a little while. Um, in jurisprudence, um, science is, is incompetent in part uh, for some of the reasons I just outlined, but in, in many ways because in the law you've got to come up with a judgment in some finite time. You can't just put off waiting to find out whether someone's going to do the right experiment to show you somebody's guilt or innocence. You've got to decide. You've got to make the decision. And in, in interpersonal acquaintance because, for example, you can't... Uh, devise scientific tests about whether I love my wife. Sorry about Fran. I know you're out there somewhere. Um, and in the end, religious faith is like many of these other disciplines. It can't be subject to the kinds of repeatable uh, and, and clarity-bearing tests that science requires. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.